We are so excited to have you all here today for the latest installment of Yakama Shi with Kathy Collins and her fabulous guest, Mr. Lee Imada. Both are true supporters and friends of the center, so we couldn't think of two more better people to spend an afternoon with. And I'll let Kathy do the introductions in a minute. I want to thank all of you and our Zoom audience for tuning in today. We will have time for question and answer at the end of the talk. So for those on Zoom, just type your questions in as you think of them, and we will get to as many as possible at the end of the talk. If you are new to the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center, which I think some of you are, please check us out at NVMC or very different, difficult consonants to say all at once, um, nvmc.org uh, for upcoming events. We have uh, a load of events coming up in, August, in April. Um, most of them are all free as this one is today. So please uh, check them out and we'd love to see you back here at the center in the near future. Without further ado, uh, let's give a big round of applause for the incomparable Kathy Collins. And the ever effervescent and brilliant and charming Lee Imada. Thank you, Deidre. Uh, so I think most people know Yakamashi is the Japanese word for noisy. I don't know if it's the same in Japan, but here in Hawaii, most of us thought that Yakamashi meant quiet down because as kids growing up, even if you weren't Japanese, it was a word we heard often, Yakamashi. And I heard it a lot, I heard it so much. I thought it might be my middle name. <laughs> I'd be willing to bet that my guests today rarely heard it, shouted at me, <laughs> because he, he is so soft-spoken. He's a true gentleman. I'm so happy to have uh, Lee Imada here with us today. Uh, Lee's, Lee's mother and my mother actually grew up uh, pretty much next door to each other in Makawao. So we have family ties that go way back and we're around the same age. We both uh, grew up here on Maui. Um, Lee right now is executive assistant to Debbie Kabibi, who's the CEO of EMEO, Maui Economic Opportunity. But most of you, I think, know me as the longtime uh, editor and before that reporter for the Maui News. And um, so I, I know he's got lots of interesting stories to share with us. I have to tell you, when I first asked him, he was, really? You want me to come? You? I said, yeah, and, and it's a hybrid event. We'll have a live audience and we'll be streaming. We, we, have, we do Zoom. And we stream on Facebook Live. And he said, well, I hope they bring no dose. <laughs> but I know we don't need that. They are serving coffee, yeah, just are. in Thank case. You. Yeah. As you said, you need to drink it black. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so Lee, uh, we'll get around to Maui News and other things. But tell us a bit about what you've been doing the last couple of years with MEO. Yeah. So. The Monday after my last day at the Maui News, I get a call at about seven o'clock in the morning um, from Debbie Kabibi um, asking if I wanted to be her executive assistant. And uh, she didn't waste any time in uh, trying to see if I would work for MEO. And I had worked, you know, I had done a lot of stories about MEO, so I knew the good work. And, and that's something that I had wanted to do after I uh, left the Maui News. I wanted to do something in the nonprofit field or to help the community. And uh, so in my role as executive assistant, I, I'm Debbie Kabibi's assistant. I, I do a lot of news releases, but I also help plan events like our fundraising gala next week, Saturday. So I've been a little busy lately, but help with planning with the senior fair, which Kathy is, is very involved with and, and the Kukuna luncheon in July. So it's basically what I've been doing for the last couple of years. It was so... Uh... Insightful. I mean, were you surprised to hear from Debbie? Because pretty much your entire adult life, you've been involved in journalism, right? Right. Um, well, I was surprised to get a call at seven in the morning. <laughs> because uh, my, my shift at that time was basically two until 10 or however long it took to get the paper out. So I was not an early morning riser. 
but um, yeah, I was surprised. I wondered if if anyone would hire me after you know I had I need to work a couple more years before I need, you know I could retire. So I wondered what I would be doing. I thought I might end up at Ace Hardware, helping out people with their hardware needs. But uh, or a, a greeter so, at, right, uh, a greeter at Walmart, at Walmart or something like that. <laughs> but uh, so I, yeah, jumped at the opportunity. Well, if you don't mind, could you share the circumstances under which you left the Maui News? Yeah, so um, it, that was the year of COVID, the first year of COVID, and um, it was really it was really hard on the staff. What we were doing at the Maui News was instead of laying off people permanently, we did a rotating. Uh, that wasn't layoff. What do you call it? Rotating shift, where three people would be off during the, a week, a week at a time. So we were always three people down. And um, so that started in March, April. And by the time September was running around, you know, I was pretty um, burned out, tired. Not to mention the stress of COVID, like I'm sure you all had to deal with as well. And um, the company was uh, offered buyouts. So I decided to take one in hopes of saving, also in the hopes of saving another uh, one of my staffers, Johns, as well. So that's sort of what led to that. So you took the buyout. You did not retire. You were a few years too young to retire. Right, right, time. right. The the buyout was about half a year's worth of salary. So it was a pretty generous buyout, but it's still only a half a year and I needed to reach 65. I think I was 62 or 63 at the time. So, um, so I know that many of the folks that came today uh, came because of the Imada, Maui News. How long were you with the Maui News? Well, I officially left after 39 years, but I actually um, was hired right out of high school. In fact, the Monday after my sat Saturday graduation, I was working for Wayne Tanaka in the sports department at, at the Maui News. So I worked that summer and I worked the subsequent summers when I went to school, uh, when I returned from college. And then after I returned from college, they um, gave me a full-time job at the end of that summer. So Wayne Tanaka at the time was photographer. He was a sports editor. Or he was sports editor. He did a lot of photography it. too. But, right. um, he event eventually transitioned into photography, becoming the chief uh, photographer. At the moment. So one of my mentors, one of my greatest supporters, and you know, my ultimate respect for him. And how how did you? Look into that. I mean, right out of high school, had you shown interest? Did you know Wayne? So, I, so the way I got the job was, and this is how naive I was, I, I uh, just wrote a letter to Nora Cooper, who was the, uh, many people may know her, Kathy knows her. She probably hired me. Too. Because she did. <laughs> Mother Cooper is yeah. what we call her. So I just wrote a letter saying that I had a really good grade point average. I had just been named most valuable staffer. And that was about all the credentials that I had. I was going to graduate from high school. Wait, most valuable staffer for the school newspaper? Uh, for the state of Hawaii that year. Oh, wow. So, in fact, my friend Christy Wilson sent me a photo that was taken of me way back when. I looked so much younger than I had black hair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot skinnier, too. Um, and she hired me for the summer. I guess they weren't looking for help for Wayne in the sports department. So she's the one that actually hired me. But uh, I was scared of her. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever she said, I did. <laughs> At the time, for those who weren't around in those years, um, the Maui News and KMVI Radio were owned by a Maui Publishing Company which is basically the Cameron family, which also owns Maui Land of Pineapple. And Mrs. Cooper, Nora Cooper, was the longtime general manager of the entire operation. And as I said, we called her Mother Cooper. She, had, uh, she would recruit for the radio station. Uh, she recruited L.D. Reynolds and a few others that came from the mainland. And I mean, she was the kind of boss she co-signed, I don't know how many car loans for, for the new DJs, um, helped find them housing, rental housing, and really um, 
you know, when I took my sabbatical in Japan for nine months, she said I was going to be covered with health insurance by the company, which is like, wow. you know, I didn't understand the value of that at the time because I was young and all that, but I've come to realize how much, of, how, what a great gesture that was. Yeah, Mrs. Cooper. So you went from being assistant to the sports editor right? and then moved into- uh... I became a reporter. So my first, um, my first beats were the Haleakala National Park in education. And um, I have to say Haleakala National Park is one of my most favorite places to be. And I, I was able to do some stuff that maybe the average person couldn't do. Um, one of the couple of my memory, most memorable three maybe, one of the early stories I got to do was to follow a backcountry ranger. So the, at the time, the, the park service had these rangers that would walk around, hike around the park. They, they were carrying guns at the time to eliminate goats and pigs because the fencing had not gone up yet. And they would check and clean up all the, um, the cabins. And they had, their, they had their own special cabin at, in the Paliku area. Back in the, um, it's a lot less rustic as, as the <laughs> and they had a chemical toilet so it was a, and they had a little shower thing which was kind of cool but I got to follow her around for two of the two weeks that uh, so that was one of my favorite stories and, um, my friend Roy Tanaka said one of, he liked one of the favorite lines is that I, I we were eating lunch and she was eating her musubi and that you could you could um, you could hear her eat her musubi you know it's kind of like rice crunching in your mouth it's not a very, you know, not something you can hear very well, but because it's so quiet there, you could hear it. Yeah. And then for the 75th anniversary, and now it's 100, so you know how long I've been there, but I was, we did a special edition for the 75th anniversary, and I got to follow around uh, Kathleen Hodges, who was um, doing research on the Uau, or the uh, petrol, and uh, we got to walk around the crater, the crater rim, and went down some stairs that I'm afraid of heights, so that was a pretty difficult thing to do. And I even got to see one of them. We crawled, I crawled up inside one of those rock, rock overlays, and I got to see a, a nesting wow. So that was pretty cool. And then the last one was when Don Reeser, the longtime superintendent at the park, took over. He was surveying the park when he just got there. So he was going in a helicopter and invited me to go with a ride for him. So I got to go to a bog. Uh, above the Paliku area, I got to see a green sword. Uh, it looked like a silver sword, but it was a green sword. Okay. And, um, and I remember stepping around, and it was all mushy, mushy in the bug, you know, in the, the bog. It was quite, quite an experience. I've never heard of a green sword. I, I assume they're even more rare than the yeah, silver sword. I haven't seen one since, but it was in that remote area of the park that wow. nobody goes to except by helicopter, I guess. So how many years did you work as a reporter before moving into management? So I was a reporter from like 81 to about 84. And then I took a sabbatical for 10 months in Japan. And then when I came back, I kind of moved to the desk. I wasn't really management. I was, I moved from reporting to designing the pages. So writing headlines. So you probably see my work every day, but you didn't know I was doing it because you know, Go by lines for the headline. So um, I did that till about the early 90s. And then I uh, got promoted. Or actually, I kind of worked the desk until I took over as managing editor in 2012. But uh, I was promoted a couple of times during that period. What were, so when you started as reporter, was Maui News Daily yet? Or was it still several days a week? So when I started in high school, there were still three days a week. By the time I was hired full-time, there were five days a week. And then um, there were six days a week shortly after I joined in 81. And that was probably, uh, <clears throat> I have to say that, which is why I probably was able to get a job. Otherwise I would have maybe had to work on the mainland, but I joined the Maui News at the right time, you know, and, and the, we were, we were building, our, our circulation was growing. Um, we, were the, we were the big fish here in Maui County at the time. You were for quite a while. Yeah. It was, a, it was Maui's own media conglomerate. Because we had the radio station and the newspaper. 
and the TV station, which That's most right. people don't realize. And it basically, it just served as a repeater for um, KITV. But yeah, KMDI TV. I'm old enough to remember. I don't know if you remember it also, but there was an occasional locally produced TV show on Channel 12 on KMDI TV. Um, I remember bowling along with John Middleton. <laughs> and it probably was only a five minute piece, but there would be John Middleton, who also served as a salesman, ad salesman for Maui News and for the paper, too, I think. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but he'd be sitting behind a desk, and there was a sign behind him that said, Bowling Along with John Middleton. And he would just report on the week's league play. Oh. <laughs> yeah. We still, the Maui News still prints the results of the bowling uh, in, <laughs> in, in their sports pages. Do we so, still have a bowling They're league? still. With yeah, just yeah. one little bowling I alley left. They're the only ones that can use that alley. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. So all of those years of writing, headline writing is a skill in itself. Yeah, I had to learn. It was back in the day. So when I started, I typed my stories up. I used a typewriter. Everybody had a typewriter. It was a different day. I remember Bob Johnson, he had like, um, he would open up his bottom drawer and pull out a bottle of whiskey, take a swig. <laughs> I remember um, doing elections and having a, a Budweiser sitting on my desk as I was writing my stories. These were different times, but um, it was it was a little raucous. But yeah, so I learned it on the typewriter, and then we we went to computers um, very early in my career, and they were hard. I mean, they were great for writing because you didn't have to do all the scratching, cutting it literally cutting and pasting together. Um, but the computer would blip out every time of, there'd be a brownout and my story would be gone and I had to write it again. It was, it was not, the start was very, very um, difficult. So that's the way, um, when I started, that's the way it was. So forget your question. I was headed, <laughs> I was headed towards something. Uh, headline writing. Oh, so. so then um, back, oh, so headline writing was also that way. So. We didn't see, now you can see what your headline looks like. We had to count. So like a capital letter would have two counts and uh, an I would be a half a count and you'd figure out how much the, the, the fit of, you know, for a headline. So you have to be learned pretty quickly to, um, to do that. And it's a skill, it's a skill. And um, I have to say that if I can pat myself on the back, my favorite headline that I've ever written was a, uh, there was a tsunami that was supposed to hit Maui County. So we were all mobilizing and, uh, to, to do the, you know, for the tsunami. And it, uh, by the time it came, it, it just ended up being a little like two foot increase in the, in the waves, you know, the height, wave height that came through. So my uh, headline was tsunami just swell. But on the idea that it was also swell because it did, you know, destroy, <laughs> destroy, yeah. but it was literally just as well. That's good. Can you recall any of your other uh, favorite or memorable headlines? Um, I, I think I there was one that I did. Um, so actually Maisie uh, Sanford set up um, Coco, the gorilla, right? Was, it, was it, he That's living right. in the Maybe West Maui Mountain? Yeah, right. Had some kind of connection with the the Coco, primate sanctuary, Coco, and Coco, the, the famous gorilla. Gorilla, and so I think my headline was something about we have a gorilla in our midst or midst or something like that. <laughs> like gorillas. But I do midst. have a story that that's on my negative side. So oh. we were doing a story every year about Christmas trees at the Foot Botanical Garden. So mm -hmm. my headline said, "It feels like Christmas time." It was like a kicker, and then it had big letters in in Kula this year. And then I decided, oh, I'm gonna make the first letters of each of the big words in green, make it a green color. But I don't want it a full green, I made it a, a, maybe a 50% of what a full, full green would be. And then just before it went to print, I said, you know, I really wanted to make that a screened color. So I bumped it down to 10%. So if you think about it, I already have a, a color that's 50% of what's green is. 
I bumped that 50% down to 10%. So basically what it came out in the paper was, it feels like Christmas time in Ula is here. <laughs> and if you really, really look closely, you can see in Ula this year. But the most funny thing is, I didn't get too much complaints because a lot, some people said they thought it was a Hawaiian word. <laughs> Hawaiian in my headline. So, and I was telling Kathy that my errors are forever um, kept. kept or wherever there's a Maui news archive, or whatever, they're, they're there. So, you know, so it keeps, it always keeps me humble. <laughs> That's why I enjoyed working for the radio side because it doesn't matter whatever you say, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, nowadays with social media, everything, so yeah, yeah. So you don't even have to be a public person. Um, somebody out there is going to capture what you said or done and, and make it go viral. You got to be really careful. Yeah, you have to be careful these days. <laughs> well, as a reporter, what are, what are some of your favorite the stories that you've worked on or interviews that I'm sure you've interviewed a lot of uh, yeah. celebrities and uh, so I I was you know I I don't have a Watergate type story in my career I'm not I wasn't that kind of reporter I, I could do good reporting you know I knew how to do a good story and make sure but I wasn't good at you know I don't have a story like Watergate or anything like that in my career but I I always wanted to tell the stories of just the average folk and before you know media before social media I wanted to give the average person a, a voice because there wasn't much of an opportunity for the average person to have a voice. So I wanted to, that, those were always my goals. Um, so some of my favorite stories, so I've always been big with astronauts. You know, I, when I, I grew up in the age of the Apollo moon landing. And so I was thrilled to interview Charlie Duke who walked on the moon, I think he was Apollo, one of the last Apollo missions. And I remember him saying that for him, it was a it was a God, you know, it was a spiritual, very spiritual experience for him. And then I also got to interview um, Scott Carpenter, who was one of the Mercury Seven astronauts. That was um, a thrill. And Bill Dana, I don't know if you remember Bill Dana, who lived in Mana. He was there as well. Oh, Bill Dana. Yeah. Yeah, I remember Bill Dana. Right. So, I, and I loved all those astronomy stories when they found Onu. Forget what is that interstellar object, whatever they call it. I talked to the person that found that interstellar object. When Ellison Onizuka visited Maui, did you interview him? No, I was not fortunate enough to interview him. Um, I remember him coming up. My son was attending Kahui school at the time, and uh, we were all very excited. He came and spoke to the students, and right. the parents got to come. Mm -hmm. Right, and I, I knew or interviewed all, all the mayors except for Elmer Carvalho, and oh. I'm related to Elmer Carvalho through my through my wife, so um, oh, you I could say. Uh, so I've I've known or interviewed all the mayors since since then. Um, oh. I've interviewed several governors and um, many Senator Matsunaga, all the old time senators. Akaka, Patsy Mink. Um, Who's another Maui girl? Maui girl. She was, yeah, I had interviewed her just after the celebration of her Title IX. She was beginning to be recognized for Title IX. And, uh, you she, attended Maui High School. I did, yes. As did Patsy Mink. As did Patsy And Mink. my mom. I was told right. that my mom was her first And most of my manager. family. And most of your family. Not my children, unfortunately, but. <laughs> Did they go to Baldwin? Um, one went to Baldwin and one went to Cedar. Oh. And I know so Baldwin is your um, yeah. <laughs> but Baldwin. It was very difficult for this Maui High parent to uh, cheer for the Baldwin and Blue. I understand. <laughs> I played in the Baldwin band right. all four years in high school. And my mother and all her siblings and my dad and all of his siblings, they all were Maui High grads. They're all. And, you know. But back then, MIL football, right. that was the thing. Everybody went to the MIL games. And I remember homecoming. We, um, we were one of the first bands to revive the tradition of a homecoming halftime show. 
marching band. Lance Joe wanted to, you know, do that. So we did. And my mother, my mom was actually a president of the band Boosters Club one year, but she told me, okay, I'm going to, of course, cheer for the band during halftime, but I'm hoping Maui High wins the game. <laughs> I got so upset. <laughs> you have to cheer for Baldwin now. Yep. <laughs> I guess it's the same way in what Texas, right? right? High school football is is such a huge part of the, the community. And it's ironic because now the schools are the big big schools in central Maui. And uh, had I been born, I don't know, three or four years earlier, I might have ended up going to Baldwin. As a result of Maui High, um, we went yeah, to, yeah. to Kahului, right? And the funny thing is that Kahului School is really funny. So you start up in kindergarten, which is at the beginning of the school, and as you get older, you get further back, and then you reach the back of the school in seven, at the time in seventh grade, and then they were building Maui High when I was uh, in my seventh and eighth grade years. So we just say, well, we we'll walk across the parking lot, and we'll go to Maui High, which is basically what happened. You know, yeah. We'll walk across the and um, so my wife's class is the first in uh, mixed class. They brought the, the kids over from Hamakuapoku to um, to the desert, as, as they would describe it. <laughs> and, uh, so my wife's class was the first combined class, and I was the second um, class. Oh. We recently celebrated the 50-year anniversary of the campus last yes. year. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, I was at Baldwin at the time, but I had gone to Makawal School. Even though I lived in town, my mom worked for the Maui Pine for the Imaile office. So she got mm -hmm. a district exemption for me from kindergarten through seventh grade. So all of my classmates, of course, went to Maui High, old Maui High, and then we got to go to the new Maui High. But yeah, <laughs> those old high school rivals yes. really went. So you mentioned your wife yes. is related to the late mayor, yeah. Elmer Carvalho. I, I would just like to touch on that a little bit. It, it's so sweet. So your wife and you knew each other in high school. We were high school sweethearts yeah. in my junior, well, my junior year and her senior year. But you didn't stay together from high school on. As you, maybe you, you can remember, you had dreams and aspirations and she was going to school on the mainland and was still in high school, you know, a senior. And, and she was finished with school. I was going to school. And so we did a long distance thing for a couple of years, but it never worked out. You know, it actually was a breakup, rekindle, breakup, rekindle, breakup, and that was it. And um, then for 30, about 30 years, almost 30 years, we, we really didn't communicate with each other. We were living our own lives. We were married. We had children. And um, actually, I can credit a Maui news story. I, I had just started starting to write again, and I wrote a story about a uh, plan to do concessions at Yale, Yale Valley State Park. And there was a big up, especially by the Native Hawaiian. So uh, I did a story about that, and it ended up on the front page of the Maui News, which was then archived into our internet. And Deborah happened to see that story and uh, saw sent your me byline. An email, saw my byline. And at the bottom, it had my email address. So um, that's how it all started. And fortunately, we both had divorces. But the ironic thing about it is that both of our kids are the same ages. So when her youngest, my youngest, grad, graduated from high school, she was living in Boston at the time. And so she moved back to Maui back in 2012. That's so sweet. And we were married by the current mayor. So I reminded him of that as I just recently. Oh, Mayor Bisson yeah. married you. And how long ago was that? Um, that was in 2013. So continue some 10 years now. With my family sitting in the jury box. Oh, in the comfortable oh, seats great. of the jury. We got married in Judge Bisson's yeah, court. Yeah. Oh, that's so romantic, isn't it? That's so sweet. I won't say the part that I was deathly sick and sweating and there's probably some sweat marks on the droplets of sweat on the marriage certificate. <laughs> and that wasn't because I had, you know, doubts or anything. It was, was a really physical sick. condition. Was really you sick. really were sick. 
Well, that's wonderful. You hear stories sometimes about high school sweethearts who, you know, part ways, um, and then re re reunite at a like a fortieth or fiftieth class reunion. Mm -hmm. But I love that Deborah found you while reading the Maui News right. online. Right. We can thank the internet. And the Maui News. And the Maui News. Yes. <laughs> Were you, did you always aspire to journalism? Well, I have to say that I wanted to be a writer. You know, I hate to say it, but I, I wanted to be John Boy Walton. You know, I <laughs> wanted to write my diary and have it published, you know, and be a writer. So I thought, oh, how can I make a living as a writer? So I thought I'd be a journalist. But what I learned as I, you know, pursued the profession is that writing is just a tool that really the good reporters are the ones that can gather information. And um, in fact, when I went to college, this uh, one of my teachers said that he valued the person that was able to get the information over the person's ability to write. There was a reporter apparently at the Chicago Tribune that couldn't write very well, but because of his ability to get news from people, get information from people, get them to talk, um, they were more valuable than the person who could write great prose and stuff. And, and I've met a few people like that. Um, we were just at uh, Chris Sugidono. He, he used to be a reporter at the Maui News. Um, he, well, he's, he's a father to be soon, which is what, why we were there, but uh, they're having a baby shower. But he was one of those people that people would talk to. There are people that people just talk to, you know, they just, he was just amazing. He would get just, he would get information. There was a shooting, a police shooting on Lower Main Street. Um, and, you know, everything was blocked off and stuff. And he found someone who witnessed the attack and got information when we had the stabbing and the Food land, I think you remember that, or Kapu, maybe five, 10 years ago, sent them down there. He found people who saw what was happening and we wit he got the witnesses. When the plane landed on um, Ilani Highway, he found <laughs> people who, you know, explained, you know, were able to describe the plane landing on P. Ilani Highway. Um, there, there are people like that. Christy Wilson, my old city editor, she was great at that too. Um, there was a, um, a case where this guy was holed up in a condo in Kihei and um, his girlfriend was in there and she managed to get her friend in the police department to describe the negotiation process. It, it was kind of a tragic situation. The girlfriend ended up being stabbed or yeah. having her head or basically being stabbed and, and she died. But uh, Christy was able to get a behind the scenes story about what happened. And Mark Adams is another great reporter that I worked with. They wouldn't send him to Molokai when there was the big plane crash. I don't remember there was a, a volleyball team that was flying back and it crashed into the side of a mountain. The Maui News was not was a little cheap, so they wouldn't fly him over to Molokai. But if you read his stories, you wouldn't have known that he did all his work by phone. He was just the great. He was, and the best one was we had a we heard a report of a plane crash about 15 minutes before our deadline. And he was able to get witnesses and he just called around the people that lived around the area. And he was able to get a very good bare bones story of what happened before our deadline. So just some examples of good, it's information gathering. That's the key to a good reporter. Do you have any opinions on how on the evolution or devolution of um, journalism reporting both in print and broadcast because it seems to me so when I started doing radio news what for KMBI I remember my dad handing me a Maui news and he said read this article and it was an article by Bob Johnson and I believe it was on a it was a court case and, and I read the article and I said, okay, I said, now, what does Mr. Johnson, how does Mr. Johnson feel about this issue? So I don't know how he feels, but you know, he just says what that is exactly. That's mm -hmm. what a reporter is supposed to do. 
I shouldn't know uh, what his opinions are. He's, you know, a good reporter, a good journalist, finds the information and presents the facts. And that always stayed with me. And I'm, I'm just really old school that way. And now it seems like, you know, the days of Walter Cronkite and all that are, are long gone. And it's difficult to find any branch of the news media, broadcast or print, that is completely objective. It is very difficult. It, it's really kind of sad, I think. I think part of it is um, reporters now, when I was in my younger years, it was like my own, I would not espouse my own personal views. Every reporter has their own personal views. But I think the difference between a mainstream news, news organization and one that's painted is that you reporters run through, there's, there's a process that you run through to make yourself as objective as you can be. Um, for example, you don't print a, a, a fact without just because one person said it, um, unless that one person is the person that's involved. Um, if it's two or three people, you know, a source that's two or three parts back, three, you have to be a little more skeptical about that. Then you require verification with more people verifying. The news. So we run through a, a, the mainstream news organizations like the New York Times where they're ranked in non-editorial sections. They go through editors and their editors will also question their reporters about you know, any kind of biases or holes, missing pieces in the story. The, the editor's job is to be the reader is what Roy Tanaka, my, my uh, mentor said, is his job is to be the reader. So he would ask some harsh questions that get personal sometimes, feel personal, but he would say that I'm just the reader and I'm asking the question, you know, the questions that they would ask, want to answer. So that's what I think the traditional news organizations are. And that's why I would, you know, I have more faith in that they're providing objective news. The other problem I have is that a lot of journalists today espouse their personal views. Even news or, you know, even like mainstream, I hear New York Times reporters who espouse their personal views. And while I told you there's these steps that, that we follow through to try to prevent that, if you pre present your own personal views, the reader, it will infer things. So I always thought it's best to not let people know that I graduated from Maui High, for example, and if I was, and I've done sports stories about football. So I, I didn't want them to know because otherwise it's biased. Um, so that's another thing. And then the third thing is that I think a lot of media people have learned that they can make money if their name is prominent. So they'll have their own talk, opinion shows. And sometimes it gets muddled up with traditional news, you know, or uh, reporting. The commentators like Sean Hannity or um, even people on you know, Lawrence O'Donnell, they're really commentators like on the opinion page of a newspaper you know um so but they get lumped together with the with the major uh, with their traditional news, objective news reporting so I, I think that's another thing but what really distresses me today is that you know you can make a lie you can say a lie not have it verified and it become almost the truth you just keep saying it, and then people start believing. And then there's a lot of people that believe the, the, lie, the lie that doesn't have, I still believe that truth is important. And for our government or to make good decisions, the truth is important. Ascertaining the truth in this political environment is very difficult. It is, I mean, we've, it's, it's strange how it has evolved that way. But like you say, a traditional paper would have the news section, and then you have the editorial right. page, the opinion page, right. where anybody could right. get their opinion. It was right clearly there. marked that this is an opinion right. page. But page. now, so it is, you know, things partisan, are so muddy. But things, yeah. Very much so, yeah. Right. So, Both in print and uh, broadcast. Well, enough of that serious <laughs> stuff. So, <laughs> as a Maui High grad. <laughs> yes. Um, that other school. That other school. <laughs> Um, so you grew up, you were born and raised on Maui. Yes. Yes. Did you live all your life 
down country or because yeah. I know your your mom's family at least were from Makawao and your mom is here, so yes. is mine, your uncle. Right. And I have to tell my mom is here, I know because she loves me and all. But my uncle Wilbert says that she's here because um she she's want to prevent me from spilling this family secrets. Uh oh. <laughs> But I do have one great family story. Good, good. So um, this week got during an interview with my, my grandmother, my mom's mother. So in Lahaina, apparently they had these um, uh, shows, Japanese shows. And there was a, I guess one of the family, one of our family members was like a more prominent than, than the others. So he would always have his, his mat right in front of the, of the stage. And um, <laughs> he was, he was bald headed. So they would call him Hai Tomaru Tsuberu. And though, and in, you know, in and of itself, that's just a name, but the way it was described to me is Hai is, um, what do you call a fly? Tomaru is like to, I don't know, to stay or, you know, to, oh, to be on. Tomaru and then Tsuberu then is to fall. So to, to fall. To fall. So because he would, you know, the fly would fall on his head, would stay mm -hmm. on his head and fall. That's <laughs> He's bald. <laughs> That's cute. That's one family secret. <laughs> Which is no longer a secret. But your mom didn't rush up here and pinch <laughs> you. So that brought to mind uh, one of my family stories. Because you see, even in the old days, no TV, right? right? And But there were a lot of live shows and the people were lucky. So my mom likes to tell this story. Uh, my mom and her older sister, uh, they were going to take my grandmother, their mother, to see a Japanese performer was coming to Maui and performing in the old theater in Paia. Is that the Princess Theater? The Queen. Queen, that was the Queen. And, and, but this was a really big deal. So my mom went early and to reserve a place because their mother suffered from rheumatoid arthritis so um, she could get around but it was difficult so my mom went and as soon as they opened the doors mom went in and she brought along Boban's zabutong, you know the cushion flat cushion and she put it on the aisle seat and then she sat there and saved another seat for her sister my my auntie and Sacha. And while she was waiting for them, this older, elderly Japanese woman comes and looks around and she plops herself down on the cushion. And my mom's, what my mom, and my mother was, was I think my mom was pretty shy to it. She was telling the lady, I, I'm sorry, this is for my mother. And the woman just refused. Well, in walks Auntie Sachin with, their mother and sees that lady sitting in and she tells her you gotta get out this is for my mom and and the woman refuses <laughs> you know so auntie goes behind and scooped her <laughs> cushion and all into the aisle and my mom <laughs> said everybody in the theater <laughs> 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 I don't know what happened to the lady. <laughs> she had to go sit in the back. But, yeah. but I will say the uh, the Maui that we grew up in and our childhood was a lot different than it is now. Population was about forty thousand. I lived in the third increment in Kahului. You know, they when they built Dream City, they built them in increments. So we're one of the earlier ones. Yeah. My parents aren't the original um, builders. They bought it. They bought the home from someone. Um, a captain, from what I understand, um, yeah, like a, a ship captain. The ship captain, I yeah. think it was. But um, and uh, in that time, I would ride around the neighborhood on my bicycle. I would run all right across Punene Avenue, you know, uh, all over town. I'd, I'd ride, I'd ride my bicycle. It was safe, except at three o'clock when the mill got out. I no. definitely stayed away from the <laughs> traffic. Um, I was able to you know, ride around. By the time my daughters were born, then I would you know, let them ride around. Like, <laughs> wherever they went, you know, somebody was watching them. But 
you know, that was the kind of neighborhood that we lived in. You know, the doors being mostly unlocked. Um, cars and cars. homes, we left everything open. In fact, um, at the end of the road, what is now Hina Avenue wasn't built yet. It was a dirt road. And, uh -huh. uh, so the school was further down the road there. Um, yeah, it was a it was a different time. We had three sugar plantations. So sometimes if you're driving from Lahaina, you get in a cane burn and clear it, and then you hit Wailuku, and then Wailuku sugar would be burning. And, you know, it was a yeah, it was a lot of cane fields where there are houses things now. I remember at night when they'd have night burns, when we you could see the flames in the distance. Sometimes my dad would say, "Oh, let's go." get in the car and drive because oh you could hear the crackling and it smelled so good the fresh the fresh leaves burning uh, you know you're an old timer when you call Kahului dream city right i remember mentioning to somebody oh yeah when they when, you know i remember when we first moved to dream city <laughs> dream city but that's that's what they called it um that was the opportunity for uh, plantation workers to have homes of their own. And it was built in increments of first, second, third. We lived in the sixth increment um, after we moved out of Waibuku. And then when I was in high school, so sophomore in high school, we got to move to 12th increment. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> but third increment, what area? So that's around Hina Avenue. Uh, it's yeah, it's kind of area. near Papa. Yeah, maybe about three blocks away from Kahului School. Um, so Hawaii Street. Uh, yeah, a little further down, um, kind of near Lanai, Kauai, Lono. They're all in that area. In between Punene Avenue right. and Papa. And when I was young, I used to go to First Increment because they had a park there, um, big park right in the middle, which I understood. I understand that was all the increments were supposed to have a park. Right? That got mixed in the next in the, all the increments after that. We'll also notice that it didn't have any sidewalks. They had greenways, but, but no sidewalks. Pretty generous greenways too, but there were no sidewalks uh, in the early increments. Did you live close enough to the fairgrounds on Putin Avenue that you could walk? We would walk to the fair, yeah. Mm -hmm. I would often walk to the fair and the, and the JC's Carnival during the summer. And the JC's Carnival every summer. July, yeah. right. Right, so. And County Fair was? Early October, JC's Carnival was mid July. Right. And the fairgrounds, well, is now where the car the, lot is. The Safeway, yeah, big car lot. Um, the old armory is the only thing that's a remnant. That was there. Nothing else that I can recall was there. Did you go to dances at the old armory? No. They had Tino Rama <laughs> during the oh, fair. Yeah. At the armory, yeah, really? for that, yeah. I only went there for the science fair. Figures. <laughs> 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 hey, <laughs> and Terry never had to say, how about she to you? Yeah, huh? I'm sure she did a couple of times. I know my Japanese school teachers said that a lot. <laughs> so you went to Japanese school too? Yeah, Mrs. Uh, the Onos were the uh, minister at Kahului Onganji, so I could go there. Oh, you went to Kahului Onganji? Yeah. For um, again, um, kids of our era, pretty much all of us had to go to Japanese school, Japanese language school. Although they also taught culture, yeah, as right. well. After regular school, and generally they were held at the different Japanese churches. So I would walk from Makoal School mm -hmm. to Makoal Honganji for Japanese school. Stopping at your grandparents' Ichiki yes. store on the way and getting our candy. Actually, we would stop at Iwaishi's store first for six cent chocolate coke. And then we'd go to Ichiki's store and then we'd go to Komoda's and then the long stretch to, <laughs> <laughs> to the, the way. Yeah. My grandmother's store was one of my favorite places. When I was young, we used, I used to go and uh, sit on the counter while all her uh, customers would come. Um, I remember every, right after Christmas or New Year's, we'd have big inventories so and she'd close the store. I think it was open every, wasn't it open every day? Or maybe they closed on Sundays. 
Mariposa. No, we were only there on weekends. Sometimes when uh, the years before I attended Japanese school, and then whenever we, there was no Japanese school, I would, your grandma would babysit me, and I, I'd wait there at the store for my mom to get off work, and then she'd come and pick me up. And um, oh, your grandma was so sweet. She always gave me soda, and I could pick whatever <laughs> candy I wanted. Which was in the an old freezer, an old uh, like uh, refrigeration. I think she right. put all the little can bubble gum for a cent. Yeah. yeah. Sodas were ten cents, I think. And I'd watch your grandpa make hot dogs, yeah. fill the casing, his machine. Oh boy. My sister and I, my uncle Wilbert and my uncle Lyle, they would uh, get the big toilet paper boxes and put us on a hand truck and put my sister and we were small. And so we could go into the boxes and cut little windows. Oh, right. so that was one of those fun. One of the fun oh, that's so sweet. The Ichiki store was right on um, Makoao Avenue, the no, Baldwin Avenue. Baldwin Avenue. Yeah. Baldwin Avenue. <clears throat> What's there now? It's not the Rodeo General store. No, it's below that. It's it used to be now. the children's store. Um, and then for a while, it was the well, the warehouse. Their storeroom was the right. um, Makawa History yeah. Museum. It was the Makawa Mystery, uh, History Museum. Right. Before they before closed. The, before yeah. the pandemic. That was the, shut down. So their store yeah. was up the, up the road, uh, yeah. just up the side. It's right there. Yeah. Uh, we are almost running out of time. I told oh, you really? this hour was going to wow. go quickly. And we would love to take questions. Do we have any questions from our Zoom viewers? Not yet. Okay, good, because we've got in-person questions. I yes. Question. Can you tell us a little bit about your sabbatical when you took time off and went to Japan for that time? So oh. The question is, can you talk a little bit about your nine, 10 month sabbatical in Japan? Right, so I was starting to get um, interested in, in my heritage, um, my Japanese heritage. And my grandmother on my father's side only spoke Japanese. And I was felt a little jealous because my brother spend a lot of time there he was younger he was about five years younger and there were she he had a relationship with her that i never really had and I, I always thought language was one of the problems so i wanted to learn language i also wanted to learn culture i tried to get into a couple of programs but i was um a scholarship type things i was unsuccessful so i actually set this thing up at nanzan university Nagoya, um a homestay program which i paid for myself because i was living at home at the time and I uh, was able to save for it. And uh, yeah, so I went to school with college students. I was a little older than them. I was 25. And a lot of them, there were a couple of colleges that were affiliated with NASA and, um, from Illinois, you know, the Illinois area. There were also international students. I met from students from Thailand, Hong Kong, China. Um, and we learned the language, we learned the culture. Um, I, I had a homestay family, which actually my mom still corresponds with one of the daughters um, of that family. And they came to visit, visit us once. Um, and I spent my time traveling around uh, Japan and also, um, also spending some time with my, uh, I have relatives direct, I mean, my father's sister lives there. And I had always been curious because I had heard that she was a victim or she was there with the atomic bomb was exploded in Hiroshima. So she didn't want to tell me her story about that at the time, but I did ask and, you know, but I also got pictures of some of the graves that, you know, learned a little bit about my family and the lifestyle that they lived in, um, in Hiroshima. And um, like I said, I got to travel some of the places that Deidre and her mom went to on the Shikoku Island. I, did, I went to Shikoku, I went to um, um, all over Japan. Um, so that's what I did for my 10 months. Uh -huh. That's terrific. We have a Zoom question now. Um, first of all, Joe just wrote in and said, great conversation, wonderful to see the both of you. Thank you, and, Joe. And uh, Marilyn Morikawa wants to know, in your opinion, what is the most important part of Maui's legacy that should be preserved? Uh -huh. In three seconds, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can answer that question because, you know, Maui's history is so broad. I mean, you could go back to the days of Yao Valley, and the 
you know, think of him of first conquering the island or even before that. But I, I will say that the history is important and I'll put it in this context that because I was working 40, you know, I have had experience of over 40, you know, 30 years, issues that people seem to think are new are not. And people try to come up with solutions um, when if they only look back in history a little bit more, they would have seen attempts or other attempts to solve. For example, um, there's a lot of talk about finding the next industry for, for the town, right? We lost agriculture, we lost sugar. There is some effort to, to try to make agriculture come back, but not on the, it's not on the scale employment-wise that you know, the sugar companies were. But I remember back, I think it was in the 80s with Colin Cameron and Don Malcolm, they realized that there was a problem that agriculture was gonna go out or was gonna be eliminated. So they tried to come up with a third um, industry, a second industry, and they had symposiums, they brought people, experts, they got people together. And this was a long process, like maybe a year. And they came up with the R&T Park, you know, which uh, MEDB and the R&T Park, which unfortunately didn't turn out to be the third or uh, the second industry, but they tried. And Danny Noe got the supercomputer there to, to anchor it. I think one of the failures of that was at the time they needed a four-year university and they were unable to come up and turn Maui Community College into a four-year university. So that hindered efforts to, to turn that into an R&T part. It's no longer that now. You know, we went up there to Maui Brewing Company and there's a, a what do you call it, a high school there now. So, and you know, a lot of the buildings are shuttered. Um, so it didn't turn out to be that, but you know, making a three person pig and trying to come up with a, another industry in three months, you know, that's not the answer. You know, you need to, this kind of broad based effort to come up with what's best for the community. Um, yes. Since you have a long history on there, Alan, what's your biggest disappointment looking? Um, disappointment in yeah, terms of? In general, from the overall perspective of the island, the growth rate, or yeah, anything I mean, in general? I, when I was going to college, I would uh, take the drive down to Kihei along South Kihei Road, which you could see the ocean. You know, you could take the drive down to Kihei. You know, this would be like the late 70s, early 80s. You could see the um, ocean. But every summer I'd come back, oh, there's a condo here. Can't see that. Next summer I'd come back, oh, there's another condo here. To the point where you can't see the, the ocean anymore. And I remember lamenting that. And I remember thinking that tourism is probably a great thing, but at some point, when are you going to kill the golden goose? You know, people right. come here for a reason. They don't come here for, to be in Waikiki Beach, where there's lots of people. And as one who followed like tourism growth numbers later, later in my career, I, I was shocked at the, the increase. Like we went from 2 million visitors to 3 million visitors in like a year or a year and a half. And I, I, my own personal view, and I can say that now because I'm no longer in the media. Um, I think we're getting to the point where we're starting to kill the golden goose. And I, and I think, you know, there are many others, not just activists, but people who have grown up here all their lives, they can't go to their old fishing spots. What do you, um, what do you think the solution? Um, well, I think it's difficult. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. It's very difficult to do that. Um, I think what they're trying to do is manage tourism, but I'm not exactly sure how. I don't know what, what the answers are. I understand you can't control the number of people that come here. Like you can't say, oh, uh, you can only have X number of people flying into, into Maui County. I think you can't do that. But I think, I think with the, they're changing with the structure, right? Because didn't they just pass an amendment to get rid of the first agency? And they're, they're going to go ahead and roll it over into another. They're, they're trying to get rid of the promotional state. This is the state from Hawaii Tourism Authority. Right. There's, a, there's a bill in the state legislature this year to eliminate that agency and um, move it into the into DBED, the Department of Economic Development. Um, I'm not sure if that's the answer too. Maybe, uh -huh. the, maybe the answer is to change the way we market the islands. You know? That's part of and that's... why you make the change. You want to get away from marketing. Yeah, but we're, we're already marketing, but maybe the answer is to market it differently. 
it's yeah you know, there's ecotourism there's voluntourism yeah. things like that other options some people think it's medical it's, tourism it's just medical tourism it's just not as black and white as well we'll just stop right. putting up these posters and stuff and I, I think you're right managing tourism and i don't know that that feels for the past but i see that we are already out of time so maybe a third career in politics, <laughs> huh? No. And no, you can no, give I, your do you, no, give your what, uh, I, I have my hat's off to any politician now. It's it's very difficult to be a politician these days. <laughs> Lee Imada, thank you so, thank you much, for so much for being our fun. guest on Yakama Shi. Thank you to all of you. What a wonderful uh, live audience we had and our online um viewers as well. And Deidre T. Garden, Executive Director of the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center. Thank you so much, um, not just for um, creating the opportunity for me to do this series, Yakamashi, but for all that you do through the Nisei Veterans Memorial Center and in the rest of your busy, busy life. Thank you so much. Next Yakamashi is, uh, was that June? I I know I have it in my calendar. June 17th. June 17th, and my guest for that session will be Urubehi Guerrero. Maui High graduate. I know. <laughs> Even despite that, I invite you to join me. Thank you once again, Thank you very much. and uh, please continue to support the UNC.